If you have your own personal website, here are five easy tips to look out for to increase the performance of that site. Now what I'm gonna do is walk through this article, five easy tips to improve your personal website performance from Salma on the Century team. Now I've been working with Century for the past six months or so. I love seeing when they have new articles and using them as a platform to have a deeper conversation around web development in general. And this one is about performance. So uh, Salma first starts by talking about why you would need a personal website. This to me hopefully is a given if you don't have one yet. You should build one, you should have a blog, you should be sharing about yourself and have a place for people to find you on the internet. So let's start with number one. And this is interesting because of how much web development has seemingly changed in the last couple of years. But number one is to serve static HTML as much as possible. We kind of think back to a few years ago and I talked about a lot of this during the last couple of years, uh, which was basically the Jamstack and the idea of serving static pages to your users. And static pages often are built at build time and then they're just static assets, HTML, CSS, files, and then maybe there's some JavaScript that are, that are static after the fact. They live on a CDN and they just get served down to the user. Now the opposite of this is what's known as server-side rendering. Server-side rendering means a request comes in, you go gather information from a database, for example, you then use that to create the markup and you return that markup to the user. So the generation of the markup is happening real time on the server. And we've really kind of flipped back and forth between what we think, honestly, as a whole, are best practices for this. But in this case, one of the things that Salma talks about is how server-side rendering impacts your time to first byte. So time to first byte is as you go to your browser to a specific URL, it's the time it takes to send that request to the server for the, re for the server to respond back with the first byte, the first bit of data. And so if the server is having to do some sort of work before it returns the data, the first byte, that time to first byte is gonna be a little bit lower. So what uh, she walks through is kind of an overview of static site generators and how we got there. And the benefit of static site generators, again, being that that content just lives out there on a CDN, it's not being generated real time. So the time to first byte is typically going to be really quick for statically generated sites because there's no generation happening real time, it's just a static file. And then she goes on to say that you don't need SSR or server side rendering. Now remember, server-side rendering means doing some additional work on the server, which can decrease your time to first byte. Now this is really interesting because the server has gotten a lot more intention over the past couple of years. We have things like React server components basically being the new way that we build React applications slash specifically Next.js applications. And those by default are loading data on the server before it's then returned to the user. So we've been kind of moving away from the idea of the traditional statically generated pages. And that's one of the things that Salman here is kind of listing that we can get away from and go back to purely content driven static sites. And I think it's important to really call this out that this is for content based websites where you're going to be consuming content like a blog. An example of this, if I go to my personal website and I was kind of looking through the JavaScript that's being loaded on here, all of this content is static. There's nothing interactive on here. I don't need any JavaScript for any of the stuff that you see on this page or on some of my other pages, including my blog. So if you look in here, all of this is static content. I can scroll down, all of it's static. It's just being loaded from the CDN for that page. Now I'm using a framework called Astro, which by default ships no JavaScript to the browser, which is actually really neat and actually does help in this case to kind of minimize how much JavaScript we're loading. We'll talk about that in a second. So if I just refresh this and let's actually clear out the network tab. So if I reload the network tab and show you the scripts that are being loaded in here, I have a script from plausible for my analytics. Then I have three scripts that are being loaded in here for Sentry, And then I have scripts that are being loaded in for Chrome extensions. So no other JavaScript is being loaded on this application. Now she goes on to kind of reference the idea that Next.js, even if you're using statically generated pages, also will ship JavaScript to the browser for hydration, which adds a lot of unnecessary JavaScript if you're not taking care of, in that case, React on the front end. So in this case, in my case, by using Astro and by not specifically including any additional JavaScript, I get no JavaScript shipped to the browser by default, except for in this case, my plausible scripts and my scripts for Sentry. Now this next one is super, super big and it's optimizing images. And there's tons of ways that you can do this. You can optimize images by converting the format. 
Something as simple as converting a PNG to a JPEG can often drastically improve your file size, but also there are lots of modern next-gen formats like WebP and AVIF that can be significantly smaller than even JPEG as well. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that these are not uh, necessarily supported by all browsers, although they are fairly supported. So I think it's probably a safe bet to include these. Now, another tip that uh, Salma had was for an animated GIF, which I've never included, to convert it to WebP, which will preserve the animation while reducing file size by 90%. Didn't know that, that's pretty cool. So uh, inside of here, she's referencing how to convert your images to next-gen formats. There's lots of different ways to do this. One of my favorite ways is with a service called Cloudinary. Cloudinary, you upload your media to Cloudinary and then you tell it to basically just serve you the, the most optimal format using these query parameter uh, properties or route parameter properties. So they have things like Q auto, which will get an automatic, which will generate an automatic quality for you. So it may be 70% quality, less file size, but it's a quality that's good enough to not really see any difference. You can tell it height and width. You can tell it to give you a next gen format if you want. And based on the browser, it will ship the correct format, which I think is pretty neat. Now, the other thing is a lot of frameworks have image components built in, which makes a world of difference. So just the next image component will do things like help prevent cumulative layout shift. That's always a trick you want to say. It will generate different versions, sizes of your image based on the screen size to give you an appropriately loaded image optimal for your site and the size that it's going to be displayed in. So there are a lot of things that you can do manually. So you can also, so you can also do stuff manually like using the picture element yourself allow the browser to choose the most appropriate image file format to download and display and then generate uh, different images as well. Now, another interesting one, I've, I haven't really thought about this, is using system fonts. So this is something that we probably all do. We go to Google, we find a font that we want, and we use that. Now, there is some performance implications of actually loading a font from Google, and even more so if you're not embedding that font in your code, but you're loading it directly from Google through a script, for example. So a huge performance boost that you get from system fonts, ones that are just built in. There's no downloading, there's no layout shift. I've noticed this a lot in websites where it loads the default font, it displays that, and then it kind of shifts after it loads the Google font. It's really not great. Uh, no flashes of unstyled content. It's really a poor experience. Now, if you are wanting to use a non-system font, you can include that as a static file inside of your server rather than asking the browser to go to Google to download that as well. So you can download the, I don't even really know these files that well, but you can download the font files, include them in your project and have them be loaded locally. Now, another thing that uh, just kind of referencing this because I know it exists and I know Next.js, Next.js actually has a font component that will take care of a lot of this stuff for you. So it will take care of, I think the one I'm looking for maybe is this one. So this will automatically optimize your fonts, including custom fonts, and remove external network requests for improved privacy and performance. And I think basically what this is going to do is have built-in automatic self-hosting for any font file. This means you can load them with zero layout shift thanks to underlying CSS size adjust property. So this is a component in Next.js that can help take care of this for you, which is pretty neat. Now, the next thing is we've already talked about this a little bit, but remove render blocking resources. Most likely what that is, is JavaScript. And this is actually where Salma did a comparison in moving her website from Next.js to 11D. 11D is specifically made for building static uh, websites and ships minimal, minimal JavaScript. And so what she found was with Next.js, her website was making over 30 requests for separate chunked JavaScript files for a static page with no interactivity. That's wild. That is so That is so wild that, that uh, Next.js does that. And this is for hydration in case you wanna run any JavaScript in the browser, in React after the page is loaded, even if you're not. Versus the same example with Elevity served no JavaScript. So you should be aware of that. This is something that I have not historically paid enough attention to is how many different JavaScript resources are being loaded, why are they being loaded and do they really need to be loaded? So in this case, she's defining or talking about render blocking resource as it's described, downloadable resource that blocks the render of a web page, delaying the time that users see something in their browser. 
this is really important. And the longer your page takes to load, the worse your first Contentful Paint FCP is. And this is something that Google tracks to determine the uh, performance of your website in their mind. FCP, first Contentful Paint. You want that and time to first byte to be as fast as possible so the user can actually see things written to the page. Now she talks about CSS being something you can't really escape. That's gonna be a blocking resource, but it's different than JavaScript, which loads way heavier than CSS traditionally. And the last one that we can walk through here that kind of goes along with everything that we've been saying is just using less JavaScript. And I mentioned on my personal website, I have, uh, I'm using Astro. I don't have any interactivity on here. So it's not loading any JavaScript outside of the couple of scripts for plausible and for Sentry. So it's loading very, very minimal JavaScript. I also have a website for my Astro course called astrocourse.dev. You can learn everything about Astro if you want to, but I actually caught myself shipping JavaScript that wasn't unnecessary and did a video about that that you can check out. In that video, I kind of walked through the JavaScript that was being loaded and realized that I was unnecessarily loading JavaScript that I didn't need at all. So I went back, made a quick change, and now it doesn't load any additional JavaScript other than JavaScript for plausible for analytics and then for Podia, which allows me to do the embed purchase for my course like this. So maybe it's time to go and take a look at your website to see if you have any unnecessary JavaScript that you're loading. But the big thing is load as little JavaScript as possible. And some of that may come with things like being able to take advantage of new CSS features. And I've seen some talks on CSS that do things that I never imagined were possible without JavaScript. So you may be able to do some things that you're already doing using just CSS instead of actually loading JavaScript. So those are the five things that Selma walked through as an opportunity for you to improve the performance of your personal website. Let me know which one of these you're gonna be working on in your site in the comments below. In the meantime, thank you for checking out the video and I'll catch you next time.